everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Arts in the City. We kick things off today in one of our hometown's most iconic neighborhoods. 125th Street is a hub of culture and history, stretching across Manhattan from river to river. An exhibition now at City University's Hunter East Harlem Gallery tells that story in photographs captured over several years. Two photographers sharing a camera on a single street. Edward Hillel and Isaac Diggs walked 125th Street for years, creating the images featured in this exhibit, Time in Harlem at Hunter East Harlem Gallery. We walked the street basically from 2008, kind of post-financial collapse, to 2011, 2012. We wanted to photograph on 125th Street from the Hudson River on the west side to the Harlem River on the east. We were interested in black space, African-American culture. It's really the cultural, economic, political heartbeat of Harlem. I would say that 125th Street is one of the great American main streets. The result of that time spent on 125th? Photographs that draw viewers in through layers of urban landscape, images that feel both intentional yet spontaneous, expansive but personal. It means home for me because I live on 125th Street and uh, they've ha happened to capture my, uh, my apartment building right there. <laughs> and uh, so it means home. Jeremiah Drake is a gallery attendant here and an artist himself. He sees transition in these images. The exhibition is sort of uh, bittersweet because we, you know, we can look back and we see how Harlem uh, as it was a few years ago, not too long ago, but we also can see the changes. The gallery is located at Hunter College's Silberman School of Social Work at 119th Street and 3rd Avenue. Images stretch along a bright hallway leading into an exhibit space. The photographs here are also part of a book by Diggs and Hillel, and the project coincides with a second book by the gallery, highlighting multiple artists who have documented 125th Street. Arden Sherman curated the exhibition. This is a story about a street, a very important street to a very important and iconic community. This really is about a moment in time and preserving that moment in time or, you know, rethinking that moment in time. The photographs on view through February are a window into a period of change in Harlem marked by gentrification and development, but they're also a window into the power of artistic collaboration. We said from the beginning that we wouldn't make a photograph unless we felt that kind of one plus one equaled three, right? That we were going to get more from being together than from either one of us photographing individually. Now we have a nice line of traffic there, red truck, man, crossing, boom. Excellent. A new novel by one of our own explores becoming an adult in turbulent circumstances. The book, Patience is a Subtle Thief, is set in 1990s Nigeria. And the author, Abby Ishola Ayodeji, is a CUNY TV journalist and a City University graduate. Well, it's about a young woman, a young girl who's growing up in Nigeria. She's been estranged from her mother for about 10 years, and she wants answers. But her father, he's quite strict and he's not really giving her what she needs in terms of information about her mom. So when she goes away to school, she meets some people that um, are interesting characters, and then she starts finding out some clues about where her mom is. So she realizes she needs money to get to her mother, so she starts doing some shady jobs to gather the money she needs. I was born and raised in Miami. Uh, my parents uh, immigrated to Miami in, oof, over 40 years ago. Um, but at, when I was 13, my parents sent my sister and I to Nigeria to go to school there and to kind of absorb the culture. Mm -hmm. And that was actually during the time period of when I wrote this book in the 90s. At the time, Nigeria was transitioning from military dictatorship to civilian rule. And there was a multi-millionaire businessman named Chief MKO Abiola who ran for president. And everyone was really excited about him. I always compare him to Obama because he 
ran his campaign on hope and people were very, very excited, which is kind of rare in Nigeria because he unified the people. People from every corner of the country voted for him. But if you read the book, <laughs> you'll find out some of what happens um, to that election and it was quite devastating. Well, I hope people take away, of course, the idea of resilience. All of my characters had to be very resilient to um, basically see their dreams come to fruition. So that's one thing. And obviously, um, hearing and absor absorbing the stories of people that are not in America or not where you live, you know, being immersed in their world and seeing what they have to deal with and why they may resort to certain things that we, you know, deem as bad. That's one of the main themes of the book. Learning to write and writing to learn. An after school program called Writopia Lab helps kids and teens discover their inner authors. Here's Craig Thompson. I wrote about my glasses because I had them like for most of my life. Since I was three years old I had glasses and now I'm 10. So I wrote about my glasses and what they mean to me and if they're important. Meet the children of Ritopia Lab, an after-school workshop at CUNY's Silberman School of Social Work where you can write about almost anything. I wrote about my necklace because my grandmother gifted it to me when she was moving and my grandfather who passed away gifted it to her. We do call them writers even when they're as young as four and five years old. We see them as writers even at such a young age. These children have stories to tell. Even if they don't know how to write just yet, um, they're still telling stories. And encouraging kids to tell stories seems to work for Ritopia because its environment is set apart from a regular classroom. If you do something wrong in school, they usually yell at you, but like here, they don't really yell at you. They just tell you like it's okay, you could do it again and they help you. If you got something wrong, they help you like get it right so and they, like you remember it. We approach feedback with warmth, with positivity. Um, we always want to highlight the things that a writer is doing well in their pieces, what we really love about their pieces, what parts make us laugh, what parts make us think about something. Rebecca Wallace Siegel is the founder and executive director of Ritopia Lab, started in 2007. From the start, the lab was bringing kids from marginalized communities together with those from more privileged backgrounds. Over time, we started serving more and more kids who are younger and younger and more broader communities and um, developed um, instructional approaches that help kids from all backgrounds and all different abilities with writing really find their voice and find their joy and find their love of writing. Aside from its main location on West 81st Street, Ritopia runs its after-school workshops in multiple locations throughout the city and the country. We don't come in with a curriculum. This really makes us different from almost any other writing workshop for children I've ever heard of. We model this more after the real adult writing workshop process where we take them seriously as writers. We try to set intrinsic goals. At the beginning of workshops, we often ask them like, what do you have as a goal for today with your writing? Is it like using a word that you just happen to come across from reading the other day? For the most part, I think the kids really enjoy the fact that there are no grades uh, because like, just New York City in general is a pretty competitive environment and like giving them that space where they don't have to feel like they're competing with everybody else. The lab has grown to almost 80 instructors and a nearly $4 million budget with a sliding scale for tuition. It's also a community for the writers who will submit entries to the Scholastic Awards. There are classes in poetry, comedy, essay writing, debate clubs, script writing, even writing graphic novels. Usually when, when young writers or teen writers enter our rooms, they right away feel and understand that this is a very supportive environment. There's a spirit and a culture of support and encouragement. Kids have to be happy, they have to be relaxed, they have to feel like their ideas are gonna be accepted, are gonna be heard, that they could be their real selves. I share my writing more here because, yeah, like the whole topic is about writing. Here, they always make sure like you're not hungry and like they provide you with snacks so that you're always engaged with the learning and you can listen to other people that are writing and listening. But over here, they're actually honest about your writing. Like if you're not doing something that well, they actually tell you. But they don't say it like in a mean way. Yeah. They say it in a way that helps you. Mm -hmm. For Arts in the City, I'm Craig Thompson.
Strand is a New York City institution revered by generations of book lovers. And now the store is fueling readers and writers in a whole new way. Barry Mitchell explains. Welcome to New York's iconic independent bookstore, The Strand, where you can find all kinds of books about all kinds of things, including coffee. God in a cup, where the wild coffee grows on common grounds, from coffee to espresso. And for the first time since The Strand was established in 1927, you can enjoy a cup of java while browsing their 18 miles of books. I reached out to The Strand in October or November of 2021 and suggested that two classic New York City brands collaborate. Brooklyn Roasting came to us late last year. We had our choice of coffee companies to choose from. They were very close to our DNA. They are New York based. They are very homegrown, sustainability, and our values matched. We really wanted to find a new way to create a really special environment for our customers, and this was, the, this was a great way for us to do that. In fact, the idea of a coffee bar has been percolating in the mind of Strand owner Nancy Bass Wyden, as it did for the previous owner, her dad Fred Bass. As far as opening up a coffee shop, we're having a big dispute about it, but I think eventually along the line there will be a coffee kiosk or something serving coffee here. I started the company in 2009 and I wanted to start a business that was focused on conscientiously sourced, sustainably sourced coffees. Build a business that honestly I could be proud of and my daughters could be proud of their dad for founding. This is my daughter Iris. Is it true that you're a tea drinker? No, that is incorrect information. I am a avid coffee drinker, I drink about two cups or two to three cups of cold brew every day. It is 95 years old, third generation owner. You had a rough time during the pandemic. How are things now? Things are getting better. It's been a tough two years. So our traffic is still down to about 2019 levels, but we are very much on the rebound thanks to our partnership with Brooklyn Roasting. Thank you very much to our community. They got us through two very tough years and the Save the Strand campaign was a blessing. Do you think the digital generation has reverence for physical books? I would say all generations value books. It is a safe place in a world in which there is so much noise and digital overload, dare I say. We are in NYU's front door, so we have a younger generation that shops here pretty religiously. And after the pandemic, folks are going back to the written word. Our attempt to continue to connect with the younger generation. From an in-store standpoint, we've introduced a TikTok table. The younger generation loves to show what they read online, and that's been a home run for us. Folks that love us, love us for who we are, love supporting independent bookstores, and they have a deep love for the Strand. Hey, I thought that book was banned. Barry Mitchell, Arts in the City. Creativity in car repair. Next, we head to a Staten Island muffler shop where auto parts become art. Our Petar Talianchech and intern Hannah Cavanaugh introduce us to the Michelangelo of mufflers. I moved to Staten Island 35 years ago. I'm originally from Guyana, South America. It was yeah, freezing cold, so I wanted to go back right away. I had no choice. There was no work back home, so I had to stay. I saw that they had in the newspaper, one guy was looking for a mechanic, a muffler installer, and then um, I showed up and he gave me the job. Coming from hardship, you know, I had to do better coming to a different country. And that would give me the drive to go forward and just, you know, keep going. Conveniently located in the Port Richmond section of Staten Island, Lenny Prince's Muffler Repair Shop has been a go-to spot for many West Brighton residents since its founding in 1996. From the outside, this family-owned business may look like any other auto body shop, but if you're detail-oriented, you may start noticing some curious creations. 
Come on, let me give you a tour. Okay, now, this is Optimus Prime. This is one of my first piece. And then we have Bumblebee. See the Twin Towers. Apache helicopter. And then over here we have Iron Man. Staten Island Ferry. And then the Space Shuttle. This is one of the biggest pieces. Took about six months. And then we have other guys. We have NYPD, the FDNY, and other pieces. Some 10 years ago, Lenny Prince started creating massive sculptures out of old car parts. The word got out about Lenny's creations, an art gallery hidden inside a muffler shop. Eventually, Prince appeared in the New York Times as the Matisse of mufflers. Despite this recognition, he remains modest and claims that his body of work came from everyday struggle. There was a period in business where there was, business was kind of slow. So and there was a lot of stress. So at the time I needed something to release my stress in the business. So I decided to take the scraps and weld together and just start creating pieces. You know, I didn't expect all of this, the volume and size and scale. I never knew that I had this kind of stuff inside of me. People start coming in the newspaper. That's not what I, why I did it. I didn't do it for publicity. I just did it for me. Trying to acquire the, the specific piece that you need for the work, that's the difficult part. You can mold and bend and twist to, to your liking, or you can find pieces that actually fit whatever you're looking for. You know, you have to locate the pieces. So it's a process in itself. Luckily, locating these pieces on the north shore of Staten Island proved to be easier than expected. This area is an industrial area. You know, there's a lot of repair shops and stuff like that. So I figured being in, the, in this area right here, I had the opportunity to acquire the spare parts to create art. In 2011, Prince created and donated a brand new statue of the iconic Francis the Praying Mantis to the Staten Island Children's Museum. This was after the original wooden statue that had been around since the 90s rotted out due to, ironically enough, insect infestation. I feel me doing that piece is a good way to give back to Staten Island. It was important to me. When every piece is completed, I feel like, oh, I feel great. Then I move on to the next piece and you know, repeat the cycle. To walk in this space and to just see my work, it kind of uplifts me every day and it calms the spirit just to see all my different pieces. Running a business with all the different emotions and stress and everything else, this is like the, the fruit of all of that, all the different emotions and um, struggle and become creative, become a creative person. Reporting from Arts in the City, I'm Hannah Kavanaugh. Al Pacino, Tom Hanks, and Robert De Niro, they are some of the biggest names in Hollywood. And Tom Riley, a distinguished lecturer at Brooklyn College, has worked with all of them. Scott Kirby spoke with him about his long career in the film industry. Remember when I worked with Penny Marshall? When I shot Big, she was great, but she said to me, you know, I've never prepped a movie before, so I don't know what to do. And I said, that's exactly why I'm here. So you talk to me and you tell me what you want, and I'll make it happen for you. Working closely with directors was only part of what Riley did as an AD. One of the first involved on a project, his job could entail setting up the offices, hiring crew, and scouting locations. Once the film began, he ran the day-to-day -day operations overseeing complex logistics while putting out fires. We solve problems, that's my job. I, I'm not rattled if there's a problem, I expect a problem. I think of a shot we did on uh, The Devil's Advocate with Taylor Hackford. We shut down a big section of Manhattan, so that was extremely challenging. And we did a shot with Keanu Reeves where he comes out of a building after his wife has died and uh, Al Pacino played Satan and he has stopped the world. And we had to have nobody there. No automobiles, no human beings, so we, we literally shut down the world. But even when shooting with stars, Riley tells us working on films was not always as glamorous as people think. I recall doing a City by the Sea, and we're shooting on the Jersey Shore six weeks of nights, which means you go to work at four in the afternoon and wrap at sunrise, and we're shooting with uh, Robert De Niro and James Franco. 
and they were dressed not unlike I'm dressed now or you're dressed. This was sort of a fall movie, but we're shooting in the winter. So their uh, wardrobe was very thin. We were out there, it was 12 degrees, February, nights, wind howling off the ocean, you know, for six hours, just brutally cold. They just have to tough it out. Gordy Willis used to say it's not all autographs and sunglasses, and I, but he said it beats mining coal. Well, working on the film Just Cause with Sean Connery, safety was a concern. I'll always remember it being very difficult shooting the Everglades on Just Cause, just because of the danger. Uh, my first scout, I think I, we counted, and I was counting by tens, about 200 alligators. So it looked like an old Tarzan movie. But they were really close. We were on a little bridge about a foot off the water, and 10, 15 feet away, you know, the gators come up and their eyes come out of the water and so forth. So it's very sobering. And uh, you learn about alligators. One, they can run faster than a man. Two, the big ones can be 15 feet long, which is like the size of a Jeep, they're big. Uh, we were there in mating season, so they were really going anywhere they wanted. So we actually had to duplicate the set and we built a, a swamp about the size of a, you know, a, a basketball gymnasium with thousands of plants and water. But despite the pressures of making sure that things ran smoothly, Riley says that it was all worthwhile. What are some of the most rewarding things that you've gotten out of being in films? The camaraderie of working in this very close-knit community of very talented people uh, is very rewarding. And then, of course, you get to see your finished product up on the screen. I approached my job always as I'm making the best movie of the year. Because I can't get up in the morning, go to work for 12 hours, and know that you know, I'm wasting my time. So. You have to really be into it and try your best and, uh, and try to do what you can to make the best movie you can. And even if, if you, you know, shoot in brutal conditions and tough neighborhoods or, you know, I've shot it in the mountains when it's 10 below zero, that kind of thing, it's miserable. But at the end of the day, you see the movie and you can watch the movie forever. And uh, it's very satisfying to know that you were part of something. I had a 35 year history in the film business working with probably 80 Academy Award winners, many great people behind the camera. So working at Brooklyn College is, uh, has been a fantastic experience because I'm able in the classroom to bring my experience to the students. I'm Scott Kirby for Arts in the City. Each January, we mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day a solemn occasion to reflect on the atrocities of racism and intolerance. And so we close today's episode with a powerful exhibition from the Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College. Here's Ari Goldberg. In 1944, all of a sudden, they took us to a ghetto. Then they got the, the trains, those boxcars, you know, but the cattle trains, you know, and we couldn't run no place. The concentration camps exhibition isn't just about displaying facts. We use pictures, we use testimonial films that we recorded with survivors three weeks before the pandemic hit in March 2020. We not only use local artifacts that were donated to the center, but we decided to try to transform the center into a space that felt a little more evocative of the camps. In order to evoke the concentration camps, but keep the exhibit rooted in the community, a local blacksmith created two gates that are reminiscent of the gates from Auschwitz. And they used wood from a farmhouse in Pennsylvania, similar to the type of wood found in Europe, to recreate the cattle cars that transported mostly Jewish people to their deaths in the concentration camps. We also worked with an antique brick company in the Midwest who specialized in bricks, stones, and other materials that would be similar to the kinds used, let's say, in ghetto walls or stones that were carved in uh, forced labor camps. While the atmosphere of the exhibition helps visitors get a spatial notion of the camps, it's also a powerful sensory connection. The goals of this exhibition were twofold in terms of the material. One was to help our students understand the diversity of victim groups, in addition to the six million Jewish people that were murdered during the Holocaust. There were many millions of other people who were also affected and targeted. That includes Polish people, people from Slavic communities, members of the LGBTQI plus community, Roma and Sinti, political prisoners, religious opponents, people considered to be asocial, and people who had physical and emotional mental disabilities. 
Creating a dynamic exhibit that focuses on the size and scope of the Nazi concentration camp system was not only an opportunity to communicate the magnitude of Nazi racism, but also a chance to display how something like this comes to pass. The enormous range of cultures, nationalities, and ethnicities that the Nazis victimized. And more importantly, the exhibit also provides an opportunity for visitors to draw parallels to modern day injustices and show visitors the devastating consequences of authoritarianism run amok. Students and professors collaborated to enhance the educational opportunities needed to fully understand the exhibition. We provide a dynamic opportunity for students and visitors to creatively respond to the content in the exhibit through a large reflection area where they can respond to questions and prompts as well as have their own creative responses to the exhibit showcased. In fact, we display a video of creative student responses in the exhibit itself in the reflection area. And we allow students to uh, incorporate their creative projects into this, into this section of the exhibit. And although there are challenges in managing a subject as complex as the Holocaust, there are also some amazing rewards. I think like my students, I feel like an enormous sense of responsibility in ensuring that this very important history is presented in a way that is accessible to people. And I sometimes have to pinch myself when I'm working with actual Holocaust survivors and formulating ways and creative ideas in which where we can present this material in ways which impacts people. With various public programs and professional development workshops, the Kupferberg Holocaust Center welcomes students, faculty, and community members to actively engage with so many parts of history that should never be forgotten. For Arts in the City, I'm Ari Goldberg. We leave you today on that poignant note. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Arts in the City.